Can OPEC still control the oil market? Cartel members are debating whether to extend a deal to cut output. Will the price of oil rise further? And how badly is OPEC being hurt by shale oil from the United States? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. The discussion was in Kuwait, but its outcome could affect the whole world. Oil-producing countries are considering further cuts in output to try and force prices higher. Ministers from both OPEC and non-OPEC countries met in Kuwait City on Sunday. They reviewed progress on their deal to cut production for six months from December. They're due to meet again in April to decide if they want to extend that deal. Kuwait, Iraq and the United Arab Emirates all expect further production cuts. We agreed to ask the other countries to continue respecting the deal next month and to give more importance to the agreement. We have reduced shipping to the United States and Europe and we will continue to reduce them further because our interests are greater in the countries of East Asia. Well, let's take a look at what oil prices have done over the past three years. Things were good for producers at the beginning of 2014, but halfway through the year, the price of oil began to fall. And it continued to fall, apart from small spikes, until the middle of last year to record lows. Oil-producing countries struggled to get their economies back on track. They decided to cut output as prices started to rise. OPEC and some non-OPEC producers agreed in December to cut their combined output by almost 1.8 million barrels per day in the first half of this year. They're now considering a six-month extension after the current deal expires in June. Well, the December agreement has lifted the oil price to more than $50 a barrel from a record low of around 30. They were at a record high of $145 a barrel nine years ago. Shale oil producers in the United States are not part of the pact to cut production. They boosted output to fill the market gap. Shale oil is extracted from rock fragments instead of oil wells and doesn't depend on the luck of striking oil. The U.S. is producing so much shale oil that it is influencing oil prices worldwide. The U.S. law bars American producers from joining any agreement that limits production. As other oil producers cut output, shale oil supply from the U.S. is flooding the market and undermining OPEC's attempts to regulate the price of oil. So let's bring in our guests now to talk more about this. Joining us in Doha is Abdullah Babu, director of the Gulf Study Center here at uh, uh, Qatar in Qatar University. In London, uh, we have Cornelia Meyer, an independent business consultant, macroeconomist, and energy expert. And joining us from Riyadh, John Svakianakis, also an economist specializing in oil and gas and a former chief economic advisor to the Saudi Ministry of Finance. Good to have you all uh, with us. So, Abdullah, let me start with you. Now, they haven't decided yet if they're going to continue um, with this cut in production for another six months. Uh, what's your feeling on, on, on whether they're going to uh, follow through on that? Uh, unfortunately, the message that came out of the meeting was uh, rather mixed. Um, initially, they said that they were, uh, they were uh, going to decide, and then they said they're going to leave it to uh, a technical committee. And that message, I think, is uh, kind of baffled the market a little bit. It might even have an effect, a downward effect on the, uh, on the, uh, and the oil price, uh, given that you know, the psychology is very important in the uh, in, in oil market. I believe that all the oil producing countries are in need of a uh, higher price of oil. Uh, I believe that uh, they are forced one way or the other to kind of coordinate. They, uh, they have no option but to uh, coordinate and cooperate in this, uh, in this respect, given that, you know, that there is uh, uh, there's, uh, already a, a lot of oil in the market and also uh, that they know that, as you said in the earlier report, that the, uh, the shale oil is uh, flooding the market uh, as well and competing with 
uh, the traditional oil. And um, given that their economic situation is so dire in some of the oil producing countries that they really have to uh, work together. And that goes for not only for OPEC members, but also for some of the non-OPEC members like uh, Russia, although we've had certain messages, mixed messages from, uh, from Russia. So I believe that they would. Uh, they've seen the benefit of uh, working together. And I think uh, initially they will come to a conclusion that they would uh, work together again. All right, Cornelia Meyer, what's your feeling on this? Are they likely to uh, follow through on this uh, production cut? Uh, they, they, I, I think they absolutely will follow through on the production cut. And whereas, you know, the, 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 the little bit of mixed messages may not have been helpful and where, whereas traders may have reacted or overreacted, you know, technically uh, the cut within OPEC will have to happen and on, Mar on May 25 when the ministers meet because it has to be a unanimous decision by all the ministers. So the monitoring committee, the, the, re the, the raison d'etre for the monitoring committee is to see, look at compliance, Compliance for OPEC is very good. It's 94 um, percent, and we will we will see more in in um, in in, um, in May. But I'm pretty certain they will comply. Non OPEC they will extend. Non OPEC compliance has not been that good. But uh, the biggest the, the 300 pound gorilla in there is um, is Russia. And Minister Novak assured the assembled ministers of the committee where he's a member um, that um, that uh, Russia would comply by April. So let's see where that goes. John Svakianakis, what's your feeling uh, uh, on this? And, and what does it mean for uh, economies like, uh, like Saudi Arabia, for example, that depend so heavily uh, on oil revenues? Well, it's not just Saudi Arabia, but the entire uh, Gulf Arab producing countries are dependent on oil. Um, as Abdallah said, that um, there are some difficult moments uh, economically, revenues have declined by more than 50 percent. As a result, you see the fiscal situation uh, becoming quite challenging for all of them. But I would agree with uh, both Cornelia and Abdallah overall that uh, if they do not find an agreement uh, in April or, or around April, it will become very challenging for all of them to maintain higher oil prices. And by higher, I refer to 50 as a psychological benchmark. If uh, oil prices begin to dip below, they could very well go to $40 a barrel. So it is compelling to all of them to see that there is a supply action taken over the next few weeks. Uh, yes, I agree that uh, OPEC has, and then on OPEC countries as well, uh, complied to more or less this 90-94 uh, percentage point that Novak referred to recently in his interview. Uh, they have done quite well, but now it seems that the market is looking for more. The market is not really convinced that uh, action has been enough, so they will be waiting for another output cut. When it comes to the economies, the economies definitely are challenged. But again, uh, let's not be very complacent. Oil has recovered quite well from the low 30s to above 50, 55 at some point. And now it's sitting at, at this 50 something range. And that's important. Important to note that um, in 2005, we had oil at $50 a barrel. And uh, that's good. It's, it's good because it hasn't dipped to $20 that uh, some investment banks were quick to announce last year. So it's positive. It's not fantastically positive, but still positive for them to adapt and adopt to the new realities that oil is at 50. It's not going to be at 80 anytime soon. And they need to do structural reforms now. Well, let's talk, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, f possible future of uh, prices, Abdullah. I mean, realistically, even if they cut production, is the price likely to go much higher um, beyond $50? Because, of course, you have the competition uh, from shale oil producers, particularly in the U.S., who are able uh, to extract oil uh, more quickly and more cheaply. So th there's got to be a certain level there where if the, if the price goes up too high, then that, that provides an incentive for the shale producers, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I don't think the shale producers are producing more cheaply. I think their costs of production is becoming lower than it was before. And uh, we have uh, the Gulf states and the oil producing states in general have a predicament. If they agree uh, on uh, 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 an a cut, 
and they tar try to maintain the oil prices 50. This actually also suits more the shale producers because you know that price is is uh, uh, quite uh, beneficial for them. Um, uh, and with technology changes and advancement in technology, we've seen that their cost of production is going lower and lower. Um, I, don't, I think the fundamentals of the market now doesn't see, at least for the very foreseeable future, uh, that the prices are going to go much higher than that. Uh, we have, uh, the market is flooded with supply, not only from OPEC and then OPEC, but also from the shale producers. We are also, you know, moving towards more alternative energy. We're seeing Japan coming back uh, to nuclear uh, power uh, as well, following the accident, uh, the unfortunate accident in, in Japan. Uh, we've seen that they also demand in China is uh, slowing down. So I don't think there is going to be a fundamental uh, shift in the oil prices. I think 50, if they maintain that, is, uh, is going to be a favorable uh, price. Cornelia Meyer, what does this tell us about OPEC as, as an organization, as a cartel that is, and, and its ability to, to control uh, oil prices? How does it compare with, with the power that they had uh, 20, 30 years ago, for example? Well, it's, it's different, but I would say OPEC has proven that they can still function because they've put together that deal and they've brought in non-OPEC players. And obviously the shale production has really has, has, changed the, has changed the sort of centers of gravity a bit. But here we have to see it, it currently I would, I would agree with, um, with, with both John and Abdullah, you know, this $50 level is, is, is a good, is, is, a fair, is a fair level. Um, we, will, we will see the shale space has changed because a lot of the small companies with the low oil price have gone out and it's now the big boys who've come in, the Chevrons and the Exxons. Exxon is now producing more than 20% of its total production is shale. So that space has, has changed and has become you know, more, more predictable in, in that sense. I would say Yes, OPEC may not, uh, given that we have now these big boys also in, uh, in the shale space, that, that, that has taken some pricing power or supply power away. I would, although not be too, I'm not subscribing too much to a doomsday scenario in the sense that the oil companies are such underinvested in conventional oil. And the dollar invested today in conventional oil is, is a barrel produced in three to 10 years. In shale oil, a dollar invested today is a, is a barrel produced in, in, in six to 18 months. They're so underinvested in that in that longer cycle um, oil that at some stage we will see that they can't produce and and we just can't keep up uh, producing quickly enough. Hence also the big boys going into the shale space. So in the medium term, I'm reasonably I'm reasonably optimistic. In the short run, yes, we will undershoot, and in the short term, we have been building. We've been building inventories, but also at whichever model, whichever prediction you look as of. Um, second quarter this year, people think that the oil stocks will come down, the crude oil stocks will come down. John Sfakianakis, can OPEC still control the, the, the oil market the, the way it used to? Well, I'll be lying if the role of OPEC is exactly the same as it was 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, undoubtedly, it has changed because of many things that have been happening over the last uh, 20 years or so. And more recently, the arrival of shale, but also one important factor that we tend to forget that demand is not what it used to be. We don't have the same type of growth in many of the Asian countries. We don't have the same kind of exuberance from financial markets. And so the demand factor is also at play, in addition to what Abdallah and Cornelia said, that supply has been coming off. It's definitely better the supply factor this year than it was last year. OPEC has managed to take off some of that supply and more has to be done. Uh, but definitely, the rise in the oil price uh, of 20% over the last few weeks uh, since the decision was taken in November is because mainly of OPEC's decision. So I wouldn't announce that OPEC is dead. Announce uh, uh, OPEC is very much with us. Um, but definitely another announcement to cut down oil has to be made now by OPEC. Well, up to now, we've been talking quite a lot about what all this means for producers and, and, and the prices that they can get. But at the consumer level, Abdullah, what, is, what does all this mean 
for uh, you know prices at the uh, at the petrol pump, for our energy uh, prices at home, that sort of thing. Uh, well, it depends where you where is home and what you're talking about. I mean, uh, I don't think that has reflected uh, a lot in terms of energy prices at home. Uh, the 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 cut in the oil price. Uh, or, or, the, uh, or the barrel of oil ha has not reflected uh, to the consumers. It's, uh, it's mainly going to government and so on, because in, in, uh, especially in Europe and US, you have lots very high taxes on that. Uh, in the Gulf states, as you know, in the, or some of the oil producing states as well, there has been subsidies uh, for oil prices. And what we have seen, uh, because of the economic situation, because of the lower uh, government revenues, because of the you know, fall in the oil price, we've seen that the Gulf countries and some of the oil producing countries are lifting up these subsidies and reducing them uh, in, uh, in some. And that means that the, we have to pay more. Uh, for, uh, for, for the oil price, for, for the gallon of, uh, of oil. So I, I think um, it's not necessarily going to reflect at least immediately into uh, the people's uh, you know, pockets. Um, it, it's definitely helping some of the industries uh, that are dependent on uh, uh, an energy and energy intensive. It's helping some of the uh, poorer countries and, and industrial countries that are importing a lot of oil. But I don't think this is going to reflect in the immediate term um, uh, to the consumers. It may do so, uh, or maybe over the medium to long term. Cornelia Meyer, what's your view on this, uh, what, what, what it's going to mean on the, on the consumer end? Uh, I mean, if the prediction is that the prices are not going to go much higher than $50 a barrel, that's got to be good news for, for, uh, for motorists, for uh, you know, be, uh, people who've got to pay heating bills, all the rest of it. Uh, it really depends on where you are, as, as I said. And, and let's get away from the heating bills because heating, um, because oil is predominantly the fuel for transportation. You know, heating comes from coal, it comes from renewables, it comes from nuclear, it comes from, from gas. So it's mainly transportation. And there I would say, um, uh, the, previous, the previous speaker, Abdullah, was absolutely right. The, oil, the, the GCC countries and the oil producers have taken away some subsidies and markedly also, countries like India, Indonesia have taken away subsidies, which is a good thing because subsidies distort market forces. In Europe, we see very little because about 75 to 78 percent of the the, 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 the gasoline price at the pump is, um, is taxes and tariffs. So we see little. In, um, in the U.S., the elasticity is much, much bigger because there's much less taxes on it. So, yes, the U.S., the, the driving season in the U.S., expect it to be a good driving season. If prices stay where they are, uh, expect people to really go out and the economy does okay, really go out and visit, visit their relatives and go on vacation in their cars in um, uh, this summer. Uh, John Svakianakis, you, you share that view? Yes, overall, I share the view. The only issue is that as uh, Gulf uh, countries reform their subsidies and uh, lift them, and they actually base the local pricing system on international benchmarking, so that's on international prices, eventually Gulf consumers are going to feel the difference. So as oil prices go up, uh, Gulf consumers are going to feel it as well. And in a way, it, they are feeling it uh, substantially because of the lifting of, of uh, the energy subsidies, uh, be it in water, electricity, or gasoline. So eventually, as we see higher and higher uh, pricing based on this international benchmarking, which has been adopted uh, in the United Arab Emirates, but also Qatar and Saudi Arabia could very well be doing something similar over the next four years. Uh, it could be that as oil prices go up, they feel it, but they feel it more because of the purchasing power that has been taken away in part because of the energy pricing that is more now uh, globalized. So I think that that's the, the local regional factor. Internationally, I think the global economy has been benefiting as a result of lower oil prices, and that's helping global growth, and uh, definitely that we're going to see uh, being a positive thing for the global economy. But overall, uh, transportation fuel is the key factor, and if we see more of a middle-class intervention, higher incomes happening in parts of Asia, 
then we will see more of a demand and demand has to come up and recover in order for oil prices to substantially go to a higher equilibrium. Abdullah Babu, given all we've discussed so far, is it fair to say we're not likely to see uh, oil prices go, go up to the, the levels that we had a couple of years ago, above, well above $100? It'll be some time, if ever, until we see that again. I think those, that, that period has gone um, and, uh, and it's way past. Uh, there has been a fundamental change in the market. The fundamentals have certainly changed and because of the shale, because of the demand and so on. Um, we will see the oil price maybe fluctuating around 50, which is desired by, at the moment by the Gulf states. It may go up a little bit or down a little bit depending on certain situations or uh, you know, conflicts in the region or OPEC agreeing or not agreeing between themselves. But the problem here is the Gulf states themselves, the Gulf states countries, the oil producing countries, have not learned from previous experiences when we've, they've had shortfalls uh, and they had uh, faults in the oil price. Um, this is not the first time, but this time is very, very different, and it's certainly not something that is not a blip in the in, in the chart. This is going to be a very long uh, period, and it's going to stay with us for a long time. So, what is needed is much more fundamental change: uh, economic reforms, subsidies, etc., uh, lifting up subsidies, but serious economic reforms and also serious political reforms. You cannot have economic reform without. Uh, political reforms and you really have to start uh, you know negotiating because this is all affecting the social contract mm -hmm. uh, within the Gulf states you cannot increase all the prices and in, in terms of oil and, uh, and and water and electricity and expect the people to sit there and um, and and to to be acquiescent to uh, the situation so I think the it's time that the Gulf states start and the, uh, some of the other oil producing countries to start thinking seriously about serious reforms and it is needed i mean we can live with lower oil prices sure. if we can also adjust our lifestyle our budgets our uh, planning to uh, to suit that well let's let's go back to john on that what's what's the view in in riyadh uh, on this uh, john sfakianakis if, if if this is a long term trend does this uh, uh, increase the need for uh, gulf countries to to diversify their economies further reform their economies and the, their political systems as well well, definitely, they need to reform economically. They should have done that uh, 10 or 15 years ago, but uh, it's, it's never late. So um, definitely, this is something that Saudi Arabia is, is doing, and it's uh, very passionate about the need for reform and change in the economic landscape. Uh, Saudi Arabia can no longer resort to hydrocarbon revenues. And uh, that's a necessity. It's a necessity for its own survival, the same for the rest of the Gulf countries in the region. Uh, they need to balance the reforms so that uh, they're not perceived as being too harsh on the short term and they need to prioritize. Um, so, for example, in the case of Saudi Arabia, yes, energy subsidies will be lifted over the next four years, but at the same time, they have put in place uh, what we call the citizen's account, which is for those in need to be able to benefit over the transformation phase of the energy reform um, agenda for them to benefit because they have lower income, so the shocking effect is not so shocking. It's something that many other countries have done uh, quite well, uh, be it in Latin America or in Asia uh, in the 80s and 90s. So it definitely economic reform is something that is uh, a necessity. It's no longer a luxury. They need to uh, privatize. They need to engage with the private sector more. And they need to make it uh, into a more business-friendly environment. Not, that's not just for Saudi, but for the rest of the GCC because the only thing we have is our human capital and our abilities to attract investments. Um, otherwise, oil, uh, as uh, was said before, is in a new paradigm shift, and it could be that we stay with oh, yeah. lower oil prices, although, as I said, oil is still at a high level compared to where we were a year ago. Uh, but $50 oil is ringing the bell that we need to reform. All right, and on that, we're going to have to leave it. Thank you to uh, all three of you, John Sfakianakis, Cornelia Meyer, and Abdullah Baaboud. Thanks very much for being on Inside Story. And thank you for watching, as always. Remember, you can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash 
AJ Inside Story. We're also on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hasm Seeker and the whole team here. Bye for now.